So <laughs> welcome everybody. Uh, we'll get started here. Uh, today's topic, uh, I see a lot of familiar names on here. So many of you have been on our webinars before. Welcome back. Any newcomers, it's good to, good to have you. Uh, housekeeping stuff, uh, we are recording this. And yes, we will um, give you a link to download the slide. So don't worry about having to write down anything or take notes. Uh, we'll send you a list. Um, we'll send you that after the recording uh, is finished up by Zoom. So usually by the end of the day, sometimes if it's things are getting really wonky, we get it out by tomorrow morning. So uh, welcome. If you have any questions, hit the Q&A button. Uh, so the chat uh, is where we'll look for, for conversation stuff. But if you have a question like Nick, Andrew, make sure to address this. Hit the Q&A button so it pops up on our screen and we can actually check off that we've answered your questions. Uh, sometimes we get on a topic that was really nuts and we don't get to all the questions. We actually will go through those and then email you individually just to make sure that we, we get you what you need. So um, as always, very informal. Um, today we're talking about artificial intelligence. It is my new favorite topic uh, as everybody that you meet, uh, everybody's favorite topic, artificial intelligence, where we are. Um, let's start here. So I want to kind of set some perspective on it. And really, we're coming at this from the um, from the viewpoint of a nonprofit development office, right? Uh, so Andrew and I have both been doing this and our whole team at PSG. We've been doing this for a very long time. We look at everything through the lens of, of fundraising here in the United States. What does this mean to us? How can we use it? You know, what are the concerns? So that's how we're looking at artificial intelligence today. So we'll start, we'll have a crowd activity. So make sure you've got that chat open. Uh, we have lived, so smarter people than I, say that we've lived through four major software technology platform shifts, okay? Um, we're gonna start with number one. So what was the first big technology platform shift back in the 90s? What was happening in the 90s? Throw it into the chat. We won't dwell too much on it, but we'll see. Teddy says Windows. Yes, what else? What was the big stuff in the 90s? AOL is up there. Internet. Yeah. Yep. GUI. Excellent. Web, internet. Correct. And Margaret, bonus points for even saying AOL. Mickey, were you, are you old enough to remember getting those CDs in the mail? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are the days. Okay. So, and I actually put a couple things. So not only, think of it as, as, as many phases within the first shift. So one, the internet. Of course, the internet becomes ubiquitous. Uh, and there's dial up and then eventually move to faster internet. But then phase two is when businesses move to the cloud. So software as a service, right? Salesforce changed the game moving from like the old days when you wanted Microsoft Word, you would buy it at the store and then install it on your computer. That's no longer the case. Now software is the service. You subscribe to things and you pay monthly or annually or whatever it is. Amazon Web Service moving the hosting, right? From what used to have a garage full of servers or whatever you needed. Now you can host it in the cloud. Big, big deal. All right. Uh, technology platform shift number two, mid 2000s. So what happened in the 2000s? So we have the internet. What happened in 2000s? Let's even be more specific. Uh, mid 2000s, let's say 2007. What was the big reveal? Got social media thrown out there. What else? Not yet. Social media, we're too early for that. Oh, we got a winner. Lisa McKelvey and Kim in Harrisburg, well done. The iPhone. So we have the internet, everything moves to the internet, even our businesses, software as a subscription happens. 2007, I believe it was, we have the mobile phone, really the iPhone, right? So up to that point, phones had screens, but really this was when the world moved to mobile. Okay? And now I believe we passed the tipping point where more people access the internet through a mobile device than through a desktop uh, or a laptop. Okay, moving quickly, big shift. 2010s, what happened in the 2010s? Some people already threw it out there earlier. We were just a little bit early. That's right, Chris, uh, Kirsten, sorry. Kirsten is correct. That's social media. And notice uh, I went cheap on this, do you see? You can still see the watermark on that image. I was so happy with that image. And then I realized I didn't buy it. So I'm getting busted for stealing something off of Google images here. Um, social media happened in 2010s. So we moved from the internet to shrinking the internet down to accessing through our phones to suddenly everything is social. Uh, it's embedded in every aspect of our lives. And in 2020s that we're living in right now, big reveal, um, I'm told by people smarter than me that AI is that next big shift, right? That it's getting baked into every aspect of our lives. We will be talking about this uh, for years and years about when things moved to AI. So the first thing that I want to share with everyone before I really get into the presentation is that you should walk away with, with this knowledge. And that knowledge is 
Uh, artificial intelligence right now, it's the wild west. Nobody has any idea. I mean, that's, that's the big, least of all us, right? The takeaway is from a legal standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, nobody has any idea where we are and where we're going. It is a big, messy area, okay? That doesn't mean that we should ignore it. You know, it doesn't mean that we should, uh, you know, stay away from it. We have to, it is going to become ubiquitous. We're already seeing that. So I want to give you guys a sense of what's happening out there and where this is going as it relates to your development office. But at the same time, just know it's messy, right? Uh, copyright issues, legal issues, ethical issues, they're all out there, donor privacy issues. So we're going to talk through all of that, uh, but hopefully in a lighthearted way, just to give you sort of a primer on what's going on in AI. Okay. Again, as you have questions, make sure to hit that Q&A button and we will get those answered. So backing up a bit. So we talked about the plat platform shifts. Let's talk about who the heck we are. Uh, Andrew and I work for a company called Pringer Solutions Group. Uh, our day job is we do fundraising consulting. Uh, our team also runs annual appeals. Our niche is large Catholic diocese. We run a lot of large uh, diocesan annual appeals for millions of dollars a year. We do Razor's Edge database administration. I believe we're actually the largest user of Razor's Edge in the country uh, by number of constituents that our people actually are managing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we've got fundraising automation. We're about to launch Automate Genius, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, and more importantly, we built this crazy useful tool called Ask Genius, which Andrew is in charge of. Not talking a ton about Ask Genius today. We will a little bit in the lens of AI, um, but that's who's hosting our webinar. So Ask Genius is our tool that we built to set ask amounts for, for direct mail appeals. That's who we are. Um, the topic at hand, artificial intelligence, I'm, excuse me, I'm gonna start as a primer with a two minute video here, okay? And actually I'm gonna stop my share, Menke, and then I'm gonna start it in because I don't know if it's gonna include sound. So bear with me for one second. And then we'll do this again. Share sound. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go on this. This is a good primer for what we're talking about today. It's a little clip from 60 Minutes. This week, 60 Minutes explores the potential dangers and possibilities created by recent dramatic advances in artificial intelligence. The AI market is expected to become a more than $42 billion industry this year, according to the company PitchBook. An AI like ChatGPT can learn or appear to learn based on the stuff that you feed into it. 60 Minutes correspondent Scott Pelley was given access to Google's campus in California and their AI lab in London to see their new technology and also meet with the CEO. Here's a preview. How great a risk is the spread of disinformation? AI will challenge that in a deeper way. The scale of this problem is going to be much bigger. Bigger problems, Sundar Pichai says, with fake news and fake images. We saw the potential with Google's experimental AI that creates pictures out of words. This is text in pictures. Exactly. Out. Eli Collins is a vice president at Google. You can generate a picture of pretty much most things you imagine. I don't, I'm happy to put it in a prompt if, if you've got something. Uh, let's try pink taxi cabs on Fifth Avenue. All right, pink taxi cabs. Instantly, we saw a shade unknown on New York cabs. Next, Collins gave us a first look at an AI system Google has not released yet, experimental text to video, which instantly answered our prompt, golden retriever with wings. Oh, look at that. As with Google's chatbot, Bard, this has safety filters. For example, it doesn't create images of people. It will be possible with AI to create, uh, you know, a video easily where it could be Scott saying something or me saying something and we never said that and it could look accurate. But, you know, at a societal scale, you know, it can cause a lot of harm. There are deeper risks people worry about, uh, you know, which is at some point, does humanity lose control of the technology it's developing? So those are some of the far out use cases which we need to think about as early as possible and get it right. You can watch Andrew, what do you feel about uh, the head of Google there <laughs> expressing a concern that AI may get out of hand and we might lose control of it? How does that make you feel about AI? Uh, it makes me a little cautious of AI. Um, it's funny, it's coming from Google. Uh, <laughs> which is right. all me, um, you know, 
There's a, a creepy. I know you're an Oppenheimer fan. You Oppenheimer fan. You went this weekend. I went. I think you went twice. I went once. But that that line in there where he's talking about, you know, there's a near zero chance that this blows up the world. <laughs> uh, okay, so that that's AI, right? So and there's so much I, I can share links all day long in terms of some great primers on it. We actually did a survey. Many of you participated in it. Um, we were brainstorming here at PSG, like how do we, we we're, we're knee deep in this, we're really learning how it works. We came up with some ideas on, on how we can use it. And then we wanted to understand from nonprofits, like what you think about it. Um, so a simple one is like a fundraising chat GPT. We'll get into chat GPT in a minute. And then a service actually automate genius already provides where we're drafting emails for you. Um, having an AI monitor the internet for any actions that your donors are taking, like they get, they found out they got married or they bought a new house or something, and then updating your, your database uh, or even draft an email for you. An AI fundraising helper, database helper. All of this was interesting. It was kind of split right down the middle between people that were interested and like very interested and the ones who were like, no, not really, you know, for us. So there wasn't any big coalescing around one or the other. What's interesting is when you do a word cloud of all the comments. So these are the positive comments. These were, uh, and I won't dwell on it a ton. You guys can look at it when I send the slides. But the words uh, for people that were interested in AI, you know, it was helpful, you know, uh, useful. This would be, you know, this would be great. I think this will help our donors. Like all the stuff that that we think of that are positives. And you look at the negatives, and it's just what you think, right? A little bit creepy, a little bit invasive. Worried about donor privacy. You know, what are the things uh, that this is going to? What havoc is this going to wreak on our development office? And we're right there with you. I mean, that's what I mean when I say it is the wild west. So with anything, you got to be deliberate. You got to be cautious. Um, nobody really knows where this is all going. Nobody knows where the where the law is going to land on any of this stuff as far as privacy concerns and copyright and everything else. But the technology is there. So we're going to have to deal with it. So maybe you look back on this webinar as the first time that you thought really seriously about AI and, and how you can incorporate it uh, in your day-to-day -day job. So let's back up. Yeah, brief history of AI uh, in the form of a quiz. In the chat, who is this? What are we looking at right here? Mankey, you can't answer because I know that you know this. Um, uh, in the chat, first person to tell me who this is and what they're doing. I'll tell you a hint at what they're doing. They're playing chess. Name one of the two chess players in this. And so he's on a little bit of a delay here. Big Blue is close. Close. So close, Mark. If this were Jeopardy, we would not be able to accept that answer. Yes, Bob Clark is correct. Gary Kasparov is the one on the left, and on the right is Deep Blue. Okay, Deep Blue was made by IBM. Okay. Uh, then we fast forward. So that was in um, that was in the '90s, mid '90s. Fast forward. This is 2011. <laughs> Name any of the three people uh, in this uh, Jeopardy challenge right now. I remember watching this. This is a big deal. Mikey, do you remember this at all? I don't. No. Okay. You had just been born, right? 2011, that was your... Oh, yeah. yeah. Well done, Lisa. Ken Jennings is correct. <laughs> Nobody knows. I'll already break the news to you. Nobody knows who the guy is on the right. He's always like the forgotten guy when Ken Jennings went up against IBM's Watson. So this was when IBM spent a whole bunch of time and a couple of years developing this supercomputer that they, they could ingest human language, right? And then feedback answers. Um, final slide in the history here of AI. Uh, name any of the two people. This is the interviewer. I don't know his name. Any of the two people in this photo, this is 2015. One of them is in the news quite a bit. Um, Elon, correct. Lori, well done. Elon Musk on the left. In the middle, does anybody know the name of the guy in the middle? Thank you, David. Aaron Ross, Andrew Ross Sor Sorkin. Sorkin. I'm, there you go. Well done. Don't tell uh, Mr. Sorkin that I don't know who he is. Uh, middle. Anybody know the middle guy? Three, two, one. Middle guy's name is Sam Altman. He is the most important guy that you have never heard of before. Uh, he is the CEO of OpenAI. Uh, his background comes from Y Combinator. Um, he's a big deal. Uh, he's, he's the guy that is going to be uh, on the front page as they develop this. He was the guy that Congress brought in to say, hey, AI is coming up. What should we do about this? Uh, this was his uh, OpenAI uh, is his baby. Okay. So what is OpenAI? We'll go down that road. OpenAI started uh, 2015, uh, and it was a nonprofit. started by some of the people we just saw there. So Elon Musk, um, Sam Altman, a whole bunch of other people uh, who are so much smarter and so much more accomplished, but will forever be nameless because that's the way that it goes, right? It's names that you would not recognize, but brilliant engineers and mathematicians 
uh, very smart computer folks, and they had a goal, and it's a very noble goal. Their goal is to advance digital intelligence in a way that's most likely to benefit humanity as a whole, right? This group said, we're moving fast towards AI. We need some framework, right? We need some organization that cares about this and puts thought into it. Um, in the old days, they said this would be done by governments, right? But that's not really how the world works anymore. Sort of like space exploration is how Elon talked about it. It used to be that only nation states could explore space. And now you have SpaceX who can move, honestly, a lot faster uh, and innovate quicker. They wanted to build something like that, right? A nonprofit that could lead and provide thought leadership, provide a framework to heading down the path towards AI. Started in 2015. Uh, and, and they will even tell you, they didn't really know what they wanted to do. They just knew that we were moving towards AI. They knew it was the hot topic. They wanted to do something and, and help move this forward in an ethical and, and safe and transparent manner. Uh, they released something in 2016. It was called OpenAI Gym, which is kind of like a toolkit. Um, in 2018, this was the big deal. Um, they first introduced this concept of generative pre-trained transformer. I will not get into the details of this because I'm not a computer scientist. I will tell you that the GPT is what this comes from, right? So the generative pre-trained transformer, when you hear of chat GPT, GPT is that. In a nutshell, what it is was a faster way to train computers, right? It was a way um, they talk about neural nets and ways for you to take a whole bunch of information and cram it into a supercomputer to train it, right? There's a new method that allowed that to happen a whole lot faster. And then in 2019, it actually shifted. So it started as a nonprofit and then it became, uh, what they did was pretty clever. They actually created a for-profit company capped inside of their nonprofit. Now with our audience of nonprofit directors, uh, this will resonate with you. The reason they did that is the same reason we do anything, right? Money. They, they, they started off uh, and as they're doing this, they realize how expensive it is to train and, and um, build uh, some of the machinery and, uh, and do it. As a nonprofit, they, they didn't raise what they wanted to raise. So they didn't hit their fundraising goal. They heard from the folks they were talking to, they, that, that they would invest in something like this, but they didn't wanna just donate. They didn't wanna donate the billions of dollars that it would take to do this. So they came up with a solution where they maxed out a return on investment of, I believe, 100X, right? So they said, okay, give us your you know, $100 million and uh, you will own parts of this and we will be able to return to you at most 100 times what you invested, but it's still guided by the board of nonprofits. This incidentally is actually kind of what angered Elon Musk, who then has since parted ways with, with OpenAI. So the, and Andrew Mankey, do you remember who is the largest investor? Who, who jumped all in on this? Uh, would it be, would it be Gates? Yes, yep, Microsoft uh, jumped. So this, this opened the door and why Microsoft has such a tight partnership now with OpenAI, because they changed the model. They said, not just a donation anymore, you can actually get a return on your investment but we are gonna cap it and it's still gonna be housed inside of this nonprofit. So that happened. Uh, and then two big developments in 2021, if you recall, they released DAL-E uh, and then in 2022, it was dal -E 2 and then ChatGPT, okay? We're gonna start talking about Dolly and images and then what AI is doing there. And then we're gonna move on and talk about ChatGPT and we'll even do some live demonstrations here. Okay, so let's talk about Dolly. This uh, came out a couple of years ago. Uh, what it was, was, absolutely mind-blowing at the time, it still is, it is a text-to-image uh, generator, okay? So for instance, I type in, excuse me, and you can do this right now. You guys just Google Dolly, you can go use this. Um, I said, I wanted to see an oil pastel painting of the Pope watching a football game on television and celebrating. And within seconds, I had, I think, 17 different images pop up, okay? Generated for me. Um, by this machine, which is absolutely incredible. I encourage you to go play around with it, but make sure you book out some time because you're going to look up from your screen and the screen is going to be five o'clock and you won't believe it. It is absolutely amazing what you can do. Um, the, the ability to, to type in, uh, in the style of Rembrandt, right? Or in the style of, um, you know, Picasso or whatever it might be. It's just nuts what you can do. It will generate this stuff for you. That has since become popularized, right? So it's, there's now a million apps that are like this. And of course, everything is through social media. I just did a quick search the other day. Um, there's a bunch that are out there that will now take this um, and manipulate photos or generate photos out of whole cloth. Uh, we did one at the firm the other day. We we're off doing strategic planning last week and somebody um, brought up this app. It's called Remini or Remini. I don't know what it is, how it's pronounced. <laughs> Shrug from, from me and Andrew on the pronunciation. But you upload a photo of yourself and then it 
creates a whole bunch of like headshots or other photos. So this was me. I uploaded a photo and it, it spits out 30 different high resolution photos for you and you can iterate and change. And it's pretty impressive, right? It's impressive on a couple ends and it's terrifying on, on a couple other. This is my favorite. Sorry for the grainy image there, but it's just a very aspirational. You know, I've got a little sweater tied around my neck. I, I think I'll make that my new LinkedIn photo. In the background. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That is very nice. I'm looking forward into the future. Um, what else do we got here? This one, I, I love it, you know, a little bit more serious, pensive, like I'm a, a man that's got some, some stuff to do. Big fan of that. Uh, look what happens though when you get into where they introduce some other things. So they, 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 they threw a kid in there for me. To be clear, none of these are real photos. None of this happened. I did not stand in front of a photographer. All of these are AI generated. But this adorable little guy, it's, it's a little grainy. I apologize. I have some more clear ones in a second. If you'll notice when you introduce other people, um, it starts to fall apart a little bit. At least this app does. Uh, you get extra fingers. You get, in this case, <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of an arm issue there. You got kind of a toe arm or something sticking out on the side. Uh, I zoomed in on this one because I loved it. Um, you can see it's starting to fall apart a little bit. So my thumb, something here. I've got a little nubbin for a pinky. There's some random <laughs> toes and other things here. Uh, so that, and that's kind of the state of, of, of AI image generation. Again, we got a couple extra hands and stuff going on in here. Um, that probably speaks more to this, this app, which is built for social media and kind of quick and light than it does the state of the industry. The truth is, I'm going to get off this picture because it creeps me out. Um, the, the truth is AI in the image space uh, is much farther along right now than really anything else. Like it's just incredible what you can do. Um, the early problems, even that Dolly had or some of the mid journey is another one that we use where it was tough, you know, drawing hands and things like that. Most of that's been resolved. It's just moving so fast. So again, we'll, we'll share a couple samples here in a bit. So that's Dolly. So OpenAI, they released the image generator. Everybody goes nuts. All the artists go nuts and say, you know, this isn't really art. And then we get to have that debate about, is it art? Is it not? The people that are putting in the prompts are saying, yeah, it's an art form for me to like how to think through, how to have it, you know, assist me. Um, all of that will continue to rage on. Legal battles will continue to rage on about what was used to train the models, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's over on the image side. On the chat GPT side, right, on the text generation side, I want to first give you a sense of how big this is and how wild people went for chat GPT. Um, this is a graph to show how long it took these apps uh, or these software solutions to reach a million users. Okay? Netflix, which we all know, <laughs> it's part of all of our daily lives, took three and a half years to get there. Okay. Airbnb took two and a half years. Twitter took two years to get there, which we now have to call X. I, I believe that news just broke. Uh, if you're watching this webinar uh, on recording, uh, this was recorded, I think, the day or two after they decided to rebrand the whole thing as X. So you'll know whether that worked or not. Facebook took 10 months to get to a million users. Think how sticky uh, and contagious you know, Facebook was in the early days. Still took 10 months to get there. Spotify, Spotify took five months. ChatGPT took five days, folks. In five days, and that is without... What's different than ChatGPT than the others on this list, ChatGPT does not have a big marketing department. They're not out there trying to make it go viral. When you use ChatGPT, there's not like a little share button to say, hey, share this cool thing you just did. Like none of the normal things that help create, you know, viral buy-in, they just released it and everybody went bonkers. And in five days, they had more than a million users. It's absolutely unbelievable. Let's actually jump into it um, and show. Um, I should have put a poll together. I won't do it now. I won't make you sit through that, but I'm dying to know how many people have actually used it um, before. Okay, share screen, screen two, here we go. Okay, so if you haven't been there, this is the website. Again, the link is in the slides we sent you. It's just chat.openai.com or you can Google chat GPT. It'll take you right here. Uh, it is free uh, if you wanna use it. If you use the free version, it sometimes gets throttled um, and you, you it slows down or, or pauses on you. If you want, you can pay 20 bucks as we do to get a, a higher level version that doesn't get throttled, doesn't slow down and you get access to GPT-4, which is a whole nother thing. All right, Mr. Mankey, let's show it how it works. What what should I type into chat GPT? What do you think? All right, let's do something fun to start out with. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, write a short poem about Spider-Man. Uh, and he is joining the circus in the style of Edgar Allan Poe. He's joining the circus in the style of Edgar Allan Poe, or do you want the poem? In the oh, it, the, it's going to be written in the style of Edgar Allan Poe. Let's see if we can figure it out. Is that it? Yep, that's it. All right, so we're going to see what ChatGPT does with that. 
Holy moly. All right. So there it was in, in Gotham Shed. I won't read it all to you. Holy cow, this is good. <laughs> so we talk about the Wild West. Can you imagine Mickey being a teacher right now or a professor and like trying to uh, like you're a lit professor, you know, and you're doing a poem yeah. section. Like, what do you do? Like, I I have I have no idea. I'm dying. Oh, to know no, I, I supposedly there's services out there where you can tell if it's been generated by AI or Chat GPT. Yeah, uh, but I have no idea. I mean, it, this changes uh, everything. On that topic, um, is Google or OpenAI yesterday the news came out? And this is all happening so fast. They actually shut down a service. I think OpenAI had one and they shut it down because they admitted it wasn't doing like it only hit like accuracy 20%. It was right when it thought it was was written by AI and 9% of the times when it thought it wasn't, it was definitely wrong. Like it's wild. Um, we as, as a consulting firm, we talk about this all the time. We could, there's a million different marketing tools that say, hey, write blog posts and all this stuff for you. Um, and our concern is always, oh, is it going to get flagged, you know, by Google for being written by ChatGPT? Um, okay, so that's one example. If you have something you want us to type in, put it into the chat. While you do that, I have one that I put up here. Okay, I want to do something a little bit more, more close to home. And by the way, Mankey, your example, it's, it is so good at that. Anything, poem, like <laughs> write a love letter to my wife, like help me, you know, like it's just, it's crazy what it can do uh, on, the, on the sort of whimsical stuff. So now we're going to do some little closer to home. I'm saying, pretend you're ChatGPT, pretend you're a nonprofit, you're running the United States, you have to plan a special event for donors. Give me a quick list of 10 event ideas, right? That can accommodate 300 people. Let's see what it does there. As a director of a nonprofit, da 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 da. All right. Dinner and awards night, all pretty. Fundraising, golf tournament, charity concert, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wine tasting. Okay, so that's fair. That's pretty benign. Um, can you give me anything more? The nice thing about ChatGPT is that it learns, and, and that's the part of the generative, right? Like it learns as you talk to it. So in this thread that I'm going to continue here, um, it remembers what I just asked for. So in this case, now look what it did. All right, I called it boring, so it wanted to get a little bit more exciting. Immersive escape room fundraiser. How cool is that? A custom escape room with themes related to your nonprofit's mission. That'd be fire. Everybody would love that. Interactive art auction a tech expo, a mystery fundraiser, mystery themed event, hackathon for social good, sustainable fashion show, adventure challenge, virtual reality streams. Now we're talking, right? So this, and, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the time that it's already you know half an hour in here. We could spend a whole bunch of time doing this. The best way to do, if you haven't used it yet, go use ChatGPT, it's gonna blow your mind. Um, Teddy brought up a thing about a lawyer that uses a site case that didn't exist. Yes, uh, so I, I am a lawyer actually, uh, it's, it's, that's a perfect example, right? Um, chat GPT, here's the, the pros and the cons. The pros are that it's amazing at stuff like this. Type in something like, help me draft an agenda for a meeting. Uh, help me come up with blog post ideas, right? Help me write a poem, whatever it might be. It's fantastic at that, at, um, identifying patterns in human language and learning and, and, and understanding what you're asking it to do. Uh, it's great at it. The problem is it's also writes in a very confident tone, right? So if I'm a lawyer and I say, help me write this brief, you know, and cite cases, it will what they call hallucinate and it will make some stuff up. And it's really hard to know unless you check it, whether or not that's being accurate. So that's the big knock on where we are in AI right now is that it will write something with such a confident tone that if you're not interacting and, and checking it, it could very well be wrong. And that's the case too. When we talk about using ChatGPT or AI and fundraising, you know, could it do some of the database tasks? Could it run a list? Could it do X, Y, Z? It probably could, but there's going to be some errors in it. That's just where we are in the state of this development. So you, I would never in a million years right now trust AI, you know, to pull reports for me or to do things that are that are doing a whole lot out there. Um, question from Natasha, does it plagiarize? This is it. This is what I'm talking about, Wild West. And we're going to talk about how it's trained in a minute. Um, using exact language from existing sources and not citing them. Another area that's big and murky, right? So they train ChatGPT on a whole bunch of stuff, and I've got some slides on this, and then it uses that to identify patterns and words, and that's all it's doing, identifying patterns and words and then spitting stuff back out. So yeah, so, so artists and, and, and copyright holders will say, wait, what the heck? You know, you trained this thing on my work, you know, or my book that was put in there, and now some of those are my ideas. Nobody knows the answers to this on how it's all gonna shake out. Um, uh, 
Okay, what else? Are the results repeatable? If you ask Andrew's Spider Man question twice, would you get the same poem? Thank you. Nope. What, what's the I rang it this morning. It's completely different. I also mm -hmm. use Chat GPT four, so I don't know if that makes a difference. But and the diff the different GPT four is, is more recent. Yep, that's a different one. Unbelievable. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm going to get lost in this rabbit hole if we keep doing Chat GPT. But so take that. As an example, let me get back to the presentation, what you all came here for. We'll do some of this. Share the screen. Um, go play with it. In fact, you know what's funny, Mr. Mankey, right now? Nobody's listening to us anymore. They all have they all have chat GPT open on the side and they're like, oh man, I had to, you know, come up with that agenda or something like that. I had to write that blog post with a bot. They're all doing it off on the side now. So it's just you and me, buddy. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> That's ChatGPT. Let's talk about how they train the models. Because this is a question that I think Natasha was bringing up. The best way to think about it is um, think about the the seminal game from my childhood. Um, a little something that we like to call hungry, hungry hippos. Okay. So there are some hippos in the world, and they are OpenAI, Amazon, right, Meta, uh, Google, the big companies, because it does take billions of dollars to train these models. Okay. And the way that they train these hungry, hungry hippos is they feed them pellets, okay? And those pellets are things like books. Think every book written, right? So I think of the Library of Congress, anything that's been digitized, uh, fiction, nonfiction, biographies, novels, they feed those in, okay? And because of that GPT, the generative pre-chain transformer, they can do it faster in a better way. That's the extent of my knowledge, right? So if we have a computer scientist on here, he's going to be cringing at the way I describe this, but that's the gist of it. Uh, they also train it on web text, right? So just crawling the web. Uh, I, I, I've heard that a lot of the models um, use, there's a data set of like the 7 million most popular websites, like apparently have been categorized somewhere. So they use that. They use Wikipedia. Uh, the hill that I will die on is everybody always um, uh, bags on Wikipedia. And, oh, you know, as, as citing as a source. Wikipedia is not that anymore. I, I, will, <laughs> I will die on this hill. If you go to Wikipedia, there is an editing process to it that is, it is ridiculous. Um, how helpful it can be. Um, so everybody used to roll their eyes at Wikipedia. You guys are wrong on how it's how it's uh, developed. Tell us how you really feel, Nick. <laughs> it is. I, I think I was talking to my dad about. It. He's like, "Oh, I probably got it on Wikipedia," and I'm like, "It's not like that anymore. Like, it's it's pretty. There's paid editors that that go through. It's an unbelievable resource. Um, news articles, social media, right? Twitter, Reddit, uh, scientific papers is when it gets really cool, right? It can ingest." incredibly dense scientific papers from journals. And then you can, um, what's one of the newest features that rolled out? You could put in a scientific paper. There's an amazing one that came out actually last night uh, having to do with the um, conductivity of um, electricity. Uh, there's a paper in Korea that came out about how they can do it uh, with at ambient room temperature, right? Which is probably a whole nother webinar we're gonna do and everybody's losing their minds about it. You could feed that paper into chat GPT and then ask questions, say like summarize this for me or why is this a big deal? Uh, chat logs, custom support logs, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, and transcripts, right? Movies, televisions, um, television shows, all that good stuff. They feed it in to the hungry hippos. Uh, they, they, they cram it all in there. And then what it does is it identifies patterns and words and learns, right? With quotation marks. And then when you, and then they developed this interface and that's really what it was, was the interface that lets you use normal human language to ask it questions. It identifies the patterns and words and then it spits out an answer, okay? Uh, there's, I'm looking for a simple diagram of how it all works. This is as good as I could find. Basically, they train it, they feed the pellets to the hungry hippos, uh, they build their model, and then they give you an ability to input data against that model, right? So that's the chat GPT interface. Mankey and I can ask for a poem about Spider-Man. It then spits out an answer. And then what happens is it's it's actually a loop. There are paid people who are training, who, who do this for a living, uh, professors, um, teachers, uh, people off the street, experts in different industries, who ask questions about areas of their expertise and then basically give ChatGPT a thumbs up or thumbs down, right? If the answer is correct or not, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're living in this world where this is open right now. So you can see it um, and, and you can go in and test it and you can, uh, you'll be shocked how much stuff is wrong, right? I, I think my alma mater Creighton University did a podcast about this where they asked it about the history of Creighton and it got like tons of facts wrong, but it was so confident, you know, the way that it expressed, you know, it was founded in this year. And you can see how, why it got it wrong, right? It's kind of like grading a paper where you can see like the logic where the kid went sideways, right? And he got to the wrong answer, but he, he, you can see what was happening. That's the phase we're in. 
we will not be in this phase forever, right? So right now we have to talk about it's not reliable, it hallucinates, you know, it, it mistake makes mistakes, absolutely. But they're all committed. I mean, they're being trained as we speak and it gets better and better and better. So think forward to a time when it will be much, much more uh, reliable, right? To be able to ask it factual questions and have a certain degree of confidence that it's right, right? So that's just the march of progress. If chat GPT follows the same as Dolly and, and how fast we've, we've come with, with generating graphics and images, uh, it's going to be no time at all, right? Before this stuff is really pretty powerful and great. Um, okay, so that's how it works. Uh, where is this all going? Excuse me. Uh, I'm five days in. We had our <laughs> we had our company retreat last week, and everybody came home with uh, with a, a head cold. Uh, this is a slide uh, to look for. So, what after this webinar, and you want to go and kind of dig into it a little bit more, go to this page on the slide. Uh, this is from uh, Sequoia Capital, a uh, large venture capital firm that does some great research projects. Basically, it's showing you in the world of AI, you know, where we're at. So in terms of it generating text, we are in 2023 right now. Uh, they're in the stage where it can generate long form text uh, and it's getting very good. By 2025, they say the final drafts will be better than the average human and by 2030, better than professional writers, right? That is not far in our future where AI will be able to draft uh, papers better than even experts. Incredible. Life-changing, mind-blowing, legal ramifications, ethical ramifications, that's where we're heading. Uh, in terms of code, uh, we have some software products. We have coders that are in India. This has been a huge boon to them, right? So one coder can now have an AI uh, co-pilot, right? That's helping them review code and identify bugs and even write code. Uh, it's still a little bit buggy in certain parts, but it's doing pretty good and it's expanding out. Um, by 2025, they say we'll be at the point of text to product, right? So we could have an idea, we could write in, build me an app that does X, Y, Z, and it should be able to roughly do that. Uh, images, you saw the, the drawbacks, right? The baby had an extra hand and the photo generated. That is all getting cleaned up, right? By 2025, final drafts um, are at ready for prime time level, okay? Video, gaming, all that stuff comes next. Uh, we're not there yet, but in, imagine a world where everybody can create their own video games right and you can have an ai tool that's doing that that is where we're going with this a super interesting uh, graphic i encourage everybody to look at that in the slides now i want to talk about before we get to discussion here's how we're thinking of it right we are a fundraising consulting firm we work with thousands of nonprofits. who are in this every day uh with our products with how we're doing how we're approaching ai we'll start here uh so andrew Mankey, uh runs ask genius for us ask genius is Super useful, right? So if those of you who don't use it, and I know we got a lot of our subscribers and users here on the call, it does this, right? It creates those, those ask strings uh, that are personalized to every individual donor. So if you are, in this case, Seeds of Hope in Denver, mainly not to 10,000 people, you wanna make sure you ask everybody for the right amount, because we know that if you ask for the right amount, people will give and they'll, you, they'll give more if you ask them for the right amount. Uh, so that's what Ask Genius does. Uh, you don't have to take our word for it. Uh, great article in the Wall Street Journal uh, back in May, uh, this big announcement, there's a, hey, we got the simple way to, for people to give more to charity. And then everything to describe is basically Ask Genius, right? <laughs> Look at what they've given in the past, do the math and invite them to make uh, personalized uh, donations, right? Give them an invitation string that appeals to them. Uh, if you want to, you can, of course, sign up for a demo. Uh, I'll leave those on the screen for a second. Mankey, so what do you think about AI as it relates to Ask Genius? Like, are we using it yet? And where are we going? Uh, no, we are not using that yet. So Ask Genius is not AI. Uh, it's really what it is, is a very, very smart um, mathematician, I guess. Oh. Um, so it will take your existing data that you feed into it, and then it will run it through calculations and then create these personalized ask amounts based off of those. So there is no artificial intelligence in this. It's just calculations. Yep. Yep. Oop. Which is even if I can pull back the curtain, when we built Ask Genius, we built it because we were running large appeals. We needed a way to solve this problem. We actually ran into a bunch of companies and all of them are like, hey, you got to check out. We've got this AI powered thing and it's a bot. And you can like just type in your name. It's going to do all this wizardry stuff. And we've never rolled our eyes so hard. Right. Like that's we were so down on AI. And this is a couple of years ago. Like everything said it was powered by AI and it was not useful. Right. It wasn't like built for what we needed. I'm a fundraiser. I'm doing this problem. I have a painful problem. Solve it for me. It was never that, right? It was a lot of fluff. I'm changing my mind on that, right? Not on those companies. They're all still fluff, but but <laughs> I'm changing my mind on where AI is going. Like as I, as I look into this and we spend a ton of time with it, I can see a time where 
some of the math that we used to code by hand, which we're doing right now, um, you know, the math of like wealth research says they can give X, but their last gift was this, but they haven't given for this long. Like we're doing all that math by hand into an algorithm. I can see a time when AI might be able to help us with that, right? Like there's a, instead of us coding it in ones and zeros uh, with a software developer, we're generating that as a prompt, you know, that then's feeding that. I could see that happening. We're not rushing into it because as cool as that would be, I, there's no way in heck that I'm going to tie AI to a donor database right now, right? I, am I wrong on that, Mankey? No, I would never, ever do that. And even as we were talking about chat GPT, um, just to tell, I mean, just caution to everyone, don't per put personal information in there right. um, because it is all, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but it's yeah. all open. I mean, yeah. anyone can go and grab that information. So you got to be very, very careful when it comes to AI. And, and the stuff, and they're trying to solve it, right? So I just read yesterday, there's an article about how they're trying to put watermarks on things. So to the question of like, who owns what, right? What what do you own when you put stuff into there? How can you tell if something's been generated is truly unique? And then that's, I suppose, you know, a philosophical argument on, is any art truly unique, right? We're all, <laughs> is any piece of music really, you know, completely new? Um, it's messy and they're working to figure it out. But while they're figuring it out, I would not put a single piece of, of personal information in there. I would not give it access to donors giving history or anything like that. Um, so that's how we're looking at it from, from an Ash Genius standpoint. Now, that's connecting true AI, you know, the new stuff to it. You're still going to get bombarded by software companies that have been saying they're AI powered forever, and they're not, right? It's just like machine learning, just like Ash Genius, right? It's 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 modeled on on, on math. So so that's where we're looking at it for Ash Genius, right? We're, we're cautious, but, but we're interested. Uh, in terms of, let me continue on here, uh, Automate Genius. Now, this is a different story, okay? So Automate Genius, uh, many of you probably got the email this morning. We're, we're officially launching it. Many of you have helped us build it uh, over the last couple of years. We're launching it on August 10th. Basically, what Automate Genius does is you have Blackboard Razor's Edge database. You can connect it to Microsoft Power Platform, which is where Automate Genius is built. And then we can connect uh, to a whole bunch of other software products, you know, Outlook, Word, which doesn't sound all that exciting. But trust me, it means that you can do a whole bunch of amazing things. So what Automate Genius can do for you and where AI can fit in Right, so we are right now <clears throat> through Automate Genius. Uh, there are users of it who are generating personalized emails. Right, uh, your development director, you open up your 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 laptop in the morning, and you've got a bunch of emails drafted for you to your donors. You go and you click on one of them, and it's to a guy who just made a gift last night, John Smith. Hey, I just saw your gift came in. What's really cool is that it says, "Hey, I think this is the eighth year in a row that you've given to our appeal," and I just want you to know how how wonderful that is. That's something that. Um, we're doing right now without AI. It's all uh, software coding, right? And automation looking inside of Razor's Edge and then generate an email based on, on those prompts. And we're doing it and it's nuts, right? Everybody's loving it. So, so we have clients, they, they open up their laptop every day, they get 10 drafts, they click on an email, they edit it if they want, they can personalize a message if they know the person. If not, they just delete it, right? No harm, no foul. This for us was an unbelievable big deal, right? When we first realized that we could do this, like we rushed it out immediately to our consulting clients and we spun up Automate Genius as its own product because we know all the different ways that we would use this, right? Happy birthday emails, that's boring and simple, but you know, those milestone gift emails to tell somebody that it's the 20th time they've given, or if they're in live or Cybunt, we're asking them to renew. Somebody just joined a new giving tier, all that stuff we're automating already. Where we imagine this will go is remember our, our exercise in ChatGPT. What ChatGPT can be really good at is drafting emails, right? And generating, you know, uh, giving, given some, some pretty strict parameters, it can come up with something that's written as if it were just written by you. So the first thing that we're gonna do as a company inside of AI is probably incorporate that into Automate Genius as sort of a last step. Now, what we're not gonna do is connect it to a donor database ever, right? I'm just <laughs> legally, uh, ethically, it's just not gonna happen. But if we use Automate Genius the way we're using it right now, and it's serving up all these email drafts for development directors and major gift officers, we could use uh, AI as a final step of take what we've generated and then make it a little bit more personal, right? Like add a seasonal greeting, you know, at the front end of this or like, a, you know, whatever it might be. It's pretty amazing what it can do. That's how I think we'll end up using AI um, for, uh, for our customers, right? And again, this is already off in the wild right now. If you want, you can check out automategenius.com. Uh, Bill Maloney is the first one to pilot out the whole drafting emails thing. Uh, and he loved it. I, I love talking to Bill. He's like, Nick, I got stopped all the time. I go to the grocery store. Somebody stops me and says, hey, thanks for that, that nice email you sent, right? And it was all drafted for him. So if you want to know more about Automate Genius, you can go, you can go to automategenius.com. Uh, and actually, 
Uh, we're doing a launch. Uh, I should do a poll here. Automate Genius launch. Um, we're doing a launch event on August 10th and we're going to do some special pricing in there. So if, if you want access to the special pricing, uh, just hit yes on the poll and we'll make sure to, to shoot you an email uh, so that you can get an invite to that. Um, if you're already a customer, just pretend you didn't hear me say that we're giving some special pricing away. So I'll leave that up for a second. So that's Automate Genius. Mickey, any thoughts on that, how we're using AI when it comes to you know emails and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it is it is amazing. I mean, I, I definitely encourage everyone to join this webinar and to see how it works. Uh, once you see it in, in motion and how it, it actually works for you, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, as myself, as a development director back in the day, I mean, this would have taken care of a lot of time uh, that I spent in following up with emails and making sure I'm getting in front of donors. Um, this all takes care of it. Um, Can you imagine how long it would take if you wanted to do that? Like if you wanted to send an email every morning of like anybody that just made their 10th gift to your yeah, house, as, what would you do? You'd like build a query in Razor's Edge and like look through it every day and then like write yeah, down. Yeah, you, like, you would say you would, like you'd build it and you maybe do it for a couple of days, but you know, huh. it, it, get, it gets away from you. So this is just a way to make sure you are doing those tasks daily uh, and, and meeting with your donors and, and getting in front of them. Awesome. So uh, check it out, Automate Genius. It's great. Uh, it is not powered by AI. We can see where we're going to incorporate it, right? But like anything, we move slowly and cautiously um, because we have to, right? That's what we want to do. Let's talk about social media. So we have a product actually um, called Catholic Social Media. Many of our diocesan clients use this now. Long story short, we provide social media content to churches, right? And, and it's it's topical, it's timely, it's safe. The, we have all the copyrights for it. We've licensed the music. Um, so it's, it's a nice, uh, efficient way to serve up content to churches on the platter if they don't have their own designer. You know, it looks something like this. A church logs in, they've got all this content in front of them. They can click on it. They can edit the text. Um, they can personalize it. They can choose what social media channels they want it to go out to. Uh, with the click of a button, it goes out. Yeah, everybody loves it. Uh, solves a whole bunch of issues for them. The, the parishioners like it that they are active on social media. All that's great. <clears throat> What's changed for us is, is we have to create a whole lot of content and we've been doing this for years. So for four or five years, we've every week just been creating a ton of really high quality content that churches can use. The cost of us and, and the time it takes us to create that content is been absolutely shattered, right? So what used to take hours can now take minutes. Creating that content got a whole lot easier. And this is where people on the line, time to pay attention again, right? Stop playing with ChatGPT and, and come over and listen to this part because it's going to save you time right now today. Um, the images that you can produce, every one of these is AI produced, right? By typing in text and, and giving it very clear instructions on what you're looking for. You know, a painting, uh, you know, of a, of a saint icon in the style of XYZ. You can also feed it images and say, I want it to be in the style of this. Every one of these things, photorealistic uh, drawings, uh, paintings, it'll do photos for you. Everyone AI generated, everyone copyright free, at least right now while we live in, it's like the earth. Mickey, do you remember Napster? Did you have Napster? I did not use Napster. <laughs> we, <For me. laughs> Rob, Rob's nodding his head in the back. Yeah, I'm going to chime in. Napster, I still have burned CDs from Napster. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that, tell me how old you are. That tell me how old is when your kid <laughs> opens up a, a wallet of CDs and they're all handwritten on there because it's like Dave Matthews concert from blah, blah, blah that I downloaded off of Napster. Uh, but it feels like that. It's the early days of everything's free. You can download it. There's no consequences. Um, the, the tool that we use uh, is a thing called MidJourney. Uh, if anybody wants to know more about that, just shoot me an email and we can, we can tell you about it. Uh, I think we do pay. It's not anything outrageous, but it's text to image generation, right? Write in what you want. You get better and better at your prompting as you do it more, and you get more sophisticated, more specific, and then it gets out you know, what you're looking for. Um, video editing. This is from yesterday, and it absolutely blew my mind. I, I, <laughs> I called uh, Menke right when I was doing it. I'm like, you've got to see what's happening here. So we use Vimeo okay, to upload. After this webinar, we will take this video, and we'll put it up through Vimeo. They just released uh, on their pro version a thing where you upload a video, it automatically creates the transcript on the side, which, you know, maybe that's not all that mind blowing. It's still pretty cool to see, but it, 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 it takes it and it's getting better and it knows what the words are and it puts the commas in and everything else. But then when I want to trim and edit this video, I can go through and click this little button here. I, I'm not doing it live, um, but you click this button in it and it removes all of the ums and all of the uhs and all the, the you know, long pauses and even coughs. It'll just delete those from the video. 
And then you can play it. And as it's going through, if there's something I don't like in there, I can just click on the text and delete it. And it edits the video and removes that portion of it. Think of everyone on this call who's created an annual appeal video, right? Or you have a donor testimonial or whatever it is. And there's parts of it that are great, but then there's a lot of stuttering or there's some silence in between. You don't need a photo you know, or a video editor anymore. You don't need that. You just need an iPhone or uh, Samsung, uh, if you're like me. Uh, <laughs> you need a smartphone, take the video and you can now edit it on your own. I mean, the number of tools that are coming out in this new AI revolution that are allowing you to do editing, to create much more polished products just on the fly. I mean, this whole thing took me five minutes and it trimmed the video down. It cut like two minutes out of it. Uh, it made me sound a lot smarter because as it turns out, I end every sentence with the word right. Uh, Mickey, did you know that? You've been annoyed for years and you never said anything? Yeah, I've always wanted to shout out wrong. You're wrong, Nick. Stop saying right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's my verbal tick, but now I can go in and instead of like having to train myself and like do it all in one take, I can just record it like normal and go in and delete that word as we're going. It's absolutely nuts what's, what's happening here. Uh, I think final example here, I want to show one more video. Let's talk about writing emails. So we talked about Automate Genius, how it can write emails for you based on stuff that happens inside of your, your Razor's Edge database. If you just want help, AI help writing an email on the fly, check this out. Yeah. Here's how to use Google's new Workspace Labs Help Me Write AI feature in Gmail to compose emails in a flash. Like any email, click Compose to get started. Then at the bottom of the email, you'll find a pencil icon with a tiny star next to it. Hover over it and you will see the words, help me write Workspace Labs. Click on it and enter a prompt for what kind of email you want to write. In this case, I asked the AI to write me an email and how to use Google's new AI tools to compose an email. Click create and voila, you now have the framework for an email. Once the email is generated, you have options to edit it, recreate it, refine it, or simply rate the email with a thumbs up or thumbs down. When you're happy with the email composition, click the blue insert button, finish up any final changes and hit send. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. First time doing a webinar. Um, so that is writing emails, right? So just you want to write an email. I, I am coach of a soccer team. I want to write a welcome email to everybody. I can have it generate that for me. Then I just have to edit it, right? It's amazing. It's the same principles as what we built Automate Genius for. Automate Genius is proactive, right? It looks through your database to like generate stuff for you to send. This is you tell me what you want to send uh, and I'll do it. Now, again, I would not connect my Gmail to any database. I don't know that you can. I would not give it personal information, but I sure as heck would use it to help me draft some email and give me something to, to start with. I mean, it's it's this is where the world's going. If you're not using it yet, uh, it's coming, right? So maybe this webinar is your call to arms. And maybe you are now the advocate within your organization to go back to the rest of your development team and be like, all right, guys, we got to talk about this. This is nuts. Or maybe you're the person that's not going to tell anybody about it, but your job was to you know, create video scripts and stuff like that. And now you're just going <laughs> to do it all in chat GPT. It's going to take you 10 minutes instead of three hours and you can, you know, play Minesweeper the rest of the time. Uh, I would love to answer questions. Uh, I'll leave this up for folks that are interested in Ask Genius or Automate Genius. That's what pays our bills so we can do all these webinars. Check them out. Uh, I think you're going to really enjoy what we built there. Uh, Mr. Mankey, you probably can keep an eye on the chat. Any questions that, that, that we want to cover? Any issues? Uh, we'll give everybody a little bit of time to type in their questions to the Q&A form here. Yeah, um, some of the questions, so I, I, it's kind of revisiting what we talked about earlier, but when you're using chat GPT, I just want to be clear about, you know, when you, it, there's always the the thought of, okay, this has been written before, someone else has, has done it this way, this style. Um, you can actually ask ChatGPT if you trust ChatGPT on the computer on the other side. Um, it actually is written as something that's unique. Uh, so it hasn't been, you know, it's not necessarily plagiarized uh, and it's been used before. So it it does a good job of regenerating in a way that no one else has used it or has has seen it before. Um, and, so keep that in mind. And that's even, um, I wonder if I have the link. There's a Harvard... Uh, you could probably Google it. There's a Harvard uh, class that's online that like where the guy came in and explained to this Harvard class about like how it's trained. And for me, that was the, the it was eye opening. It's not. Yeah, it's not copying text and serving up text. It's it's taking in the, <laughs> the entire written word that they fed it. And then it's identifying patterns between words. And then it's taking your input and generating those. So it's not looking for something to spit out that's already been written. It's actually generating it. Now, it's not thinking. Right. It feels like it is. It's just, you know, identifying the patterns, you know, as they happen. Uh, Jessica, I appreciate this. I saw this in the chat. 
Uh, we'd asked about high schools and colleges. She said her daughter's professors are writing questions until chat GPT gets it wrong. And then they know they have a good question for students. That's brilliant, right? What a great way uh, in this age to find out whether kids are getting help or not. Um, I wonder, Mankey, if it'll be like calculators, right? So there was a time, I'm sure, when math teachers were like, this, we can't give kids calculators. This is nuts. They're going to just, you know, nobody's going to think anymore. But eventually you have to succumb and you incorporate calculators into the, the work that you're doing because it's more realistic. I imagine we'll get to that point. Uh, I don't envy anybody that's in, you know, uh, higher ed right now, but uh, I think uh, that's probably where we got to go. Uh, okay, any other questions? We, we talked about this. Does it plagiarize? Probably. Uh, is it legal? Unsure. <laughs> you know, like, uh, what, you know, uh, what's, uh, I know, I can say confidently right now, if you use a um, image generator, right, to create some sort of graphic for you, if you use it uh, and through prompts like refine it, you're going to be fine. There's no artist that owns that thing. It generated it for you. You're copyright free. You can use it. Um, that could change through legislation, but at least as of right now, you're fine. Um, saw a comment in here about using it to write social media posts. Yes, absolutely. It's fantastic for that. Uh, Mankey, any, how do you use it? Do you use ChatGPT on a regular basis? I do. I actually, I use it probably more than I should. Uh, <laughs> I kind of get down that rabbit hole. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I use it for, you know, things we've, we've mentioned before. I mean, drafting emails, um, posts, blogs, you know, and, and I don't use it as like, okay, chat GPT, give me this, and then I copy and paste. It's more of a starting point, like it gets me to a good spot where I can then take that and then create it as if it's my own. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how I use it. Um, I also for really like, you know, art, you know, wordy articles that I don't really understand, like that I, I, I want to, and I hear I gotta, I gotta, hear, you know, learn about this. I'll jump, I'll pop it into chat GPT, tell chat GPT to read it to me as if I'm a, a eighth grader. Yeah. It's be a really good summary. So yes. it's, it's like that. I, I use it quite a bit. And I, I love that feature of it too. Like I pretend I'm a, you know, high school level student and explain to me what this is, right? Like it's, it's so dang useful, right? Um, I was showing it to my wife, uh, she, you know, because talking about work and I said I had this coming up and she hadn't used it before. So we she was absolutely blown away and terrified and hated it. Right. Like wanted to throw the computer away because we're <laughs> we're using it. Uh, her and I had had this debate about um, we, we got a bunch of kids now and life's crazy. We're like, OK, what if we had somebody help clean the house like once a month or something? She's dead set against it. Right. I'm absolutely I'm, I live my life to optimize. I'm like, this is this <laughs> absolutely no brainer. And we're so far apart on this. So I fed that question in I'm like, I, to chat GPT. I'm like, hey, I've got a wife. She doesn't want to like what are things I should say? And it like wrote out this script. And then it asked if it want, like, do you want to like do a role playing exercise to like pretend you're having the conversation? And like it was it was so crazy. But then Holly now thinks that anything I ever send her, you know, is from chat GPT and it's not really, you know, my authentic. So that's the bad news, guys and, and gals. Anytime if, if you've used it, you know, to write a little, you know, romantic love letter or something to your spouse to sell them how great they are. Once they know that chat GPT exists, they'll never think that it was your original work anymore. Um, OK, went down a rabbit hole there. Last call for questions. If not, we're right at the hour. Uh, we will send out this video recording. Uh, we will send out the link to where you can download the slides. Uh, make sure if you haven't yet checked out Ask Genius, check it out. You can set up a demo or we've got a live public demo next Wednesday. Automate Genius, big kickoff launch August 10th. Um, you can also schedule private one-on-one -on -one demo uh, with our good friend Andy. We're so proud of what we do. Well, we love all of the folks that attend this stuff and, and hang on with us. So thank you for coming. If you have an idea for a future webinar that you want to know about uh, from a development lens, let us know and we'll be sure to add it in. Okay. Thank you all so much uh, and we'll see you on the next one.